Chevrolet recently released an online commercial for their new Malibu sedan. Here's what I want us to do as we're starting this morning. I want you to watch this commercial and tell me what they're selling. What is it that they're offering those that purchase this, this vehicle from this ad? Let's watch it together. So, you're tooling along in your Malibu, and bam, some guy darts across your lane. You swerve and hit the ditch just hard enough to know you did some damage. Seconds, I mean seconds later, an advisor comes through the stereo speakers and says, OnStar, is there an emergency? As you realize there was, some high-tech motion sensor was activated. A signal shot out 12,000 miles from orbiting satellites to calculate your exact coordinates along with where you were hit and how hard, automatically alerting an advisor who offered to call an ambulance and dispatch a nearby tow truck, for which you thanked him profusely. You did not do one single thing, and yet a potent combination of amazing technology and human concern are swirling around you as a deep wave of relief washes over you. All because you drive a Chevrolet Malibu, connected by OnStar. Find new roads. Okay, so the problem is you're in an incapacitated car in a remote location. So you're isolated and alone. The solution is an ambulance and a tow truck mysteriously show up providing care for you and your car. But what are they selling? I'm going to suggest it's not the Malibu. For $25,000, apparently you get a car with bad brakes and sloppy steering. What they're selling is connections. Within seconds of a problem arising because of a trusted advisor connecting you to the solution. You're not alone. Well, how are these, according to commercial, achieved? How the connections made? You have potent technology max, matched with human concern, which equals you are connected. In fact, the name of the ad campaign is Life Simply Connected. And isn't that what we want? Or isn't that what we say that we want? We want to feel like we're not alone in this world. We want to feel like we're connected, that we have relationships that we have someone that's covering our back, a place to belong. We want to matter to someone. But at the same time, many are reluctant to let down their guard in order for these connections to be made. Uh, two weeks ago on a technology information uh, radio show out of Jacksonville, Florida called Deemable Tech, uh, there was a listener that emailed in to the two hosts of the show and her name is Kim, and this was her question that she had for the host. She says, there was a break-in at my neighbor's house last night. If I hadn't seen the cops pull up as I was leaving for work, I wouldn't have known about it. It made me realize just how few of my neighbors I actually know. Is there a website or some other way I can get to know my neighbors that doesn't require going to the door and meeting my neighbor in person. Isn't that great? That's fantastic. Is there some way? I don't want to actually make this effort. Well, the host's response was, isn't it ironic that with Facebook and Twitter, we could know what a random acquaintance from high school had for lunch, but we still might not know the name of three of our neighbors. So have we bought into this idea that technology matched with human concern equals you're connected if you have bought into that it's a myth it's a myth we can't uh, somehow bypass the age-old ways of connecting with one another and certainly we live in a kind of society where we want to have the security of these connections without some would say the hassle of these connections or taking the time to build these relationships so in essence, what a lot of people are seeking is community, yes, but community on my terms. And for some, this type of community on my terms has crept into their way of doing church. Richard Foster, in his book, Streams of, of Living Water, champions the benefits of, of contemplative time with God and allowing uh, God to search your heart and for you to know God's heart better through the disciplines. But the danger, though, is that through this time alone with God will be substituted for authentic community you find within the church. And so when this happens, the, the benefits of this 
spiritual discipline can also have incredible side effects and pre present serious weakness in our spiritual life. Here's what Foster writes. The contemplative stress upon our solitariness before God, a message we desperately need to hear, can lead us, especially in Western cultures, into an individualism that thinks only in terms of God and me. True, God may call out an occasional Elijah or John the Baptist, but these, exceptions, these are only exceptions to prove the rule. The vast majority of us are not, to meet, are not meant to live out our faith in isolation. So we need the community of faith. We need to build these connections and build these relationships. We need brothers and sisters that we're invested in their lives and they're invested in ours to support us and give us their discernment. We need connections. If you have your Bible, turn to me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 will be our text for the day. And as we're looking at Hebrews chapter 10, I want to give you just a little bit of background about Hebrews in that uh, it was written to Jewish Christians that because they're undergoing uh, persecution and hardships are considering going back to their quote-unquote easier way of life before they encounter Jesus Christ. So re reverting back to their time under the law. And so that, that's what's happening here. And so to combat this, a Hebrew writer is going to make a case for the absolute supremacy and the absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ as a revealer and mediator of God's, God's grace. So what's going to happen up to this point is he proves the point that, that Jesus is vastly superior to Moses and the ancient prophets and to Aaron and the priesthood and the line, the lineage that came after that. And Jesus is even superior to angels. So as the Hebrew writers make a case for all these different things, it, it's almost like he, he says, hold on, we, we've had enough theology for a while. We've got to talk about how this is going to be practical. So he pauses in chapter 10 to talk about these connections. And this is what he said, starting in verse 24, uh, 22. Therefore, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up. Let us not give up meeting together as some in the habit of do it, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So this is what's, what's happening here. And so within this text, he says, we've got all this wonderful things in Jesus, and this is who, who he is, but now let me give you five directives or, or five appeals as you work this out within community. So these are going to be five ways in which it helps us to make these kind of godly connections. And the first is, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. You know, because we as a body of believers have a confident spirit within us, is what the text talks about. And we also have a competent advocate. So a confident spirit that comes from a competent advocate. We can gather together as a group of people like no other group of people that you'll meet with. Because we're all basing our relationships, as was discussed earlier, on Jesus' sacrifice that brings us into relationship with God. So our community is all about getting to, uh, together with other people that are rabid fans of God. Let, trying to put it in football terms. I mean, why else do we drive three or four hours to go watch a football game? Is it so that you can see the action better? No, e even the best uh, seats at the 50-yard line can't compare to the view that you'll get sitting in your easy chair. But you drive three to four hours because you want to feel the energy. You, you want to feel the passion. And you want to be surrounded by people that are just as nuts about your team as you are. And that's the experience. That's the collection of being with people of like mind in the same community. It validates who we are as a person. So together, we come together. It, it magnifies and intensifies our love we have for God and the worship that we offer up to Him. The second thing is, is let us hold unswervingly 
to the hope that we profess. I, I have to tell you, being out in the world, and, and I spent some time in the secular world you know, working in insurance and advertising and doing a variety of different things, it, it's tough. When you're in, or, and definitely in school, when you're hanging out with people that don't have the same uh, worldview as you, when, when Jesus is not the number one thing in their life, they see life in the present and life in the future through a different lens. And so to gather together with people of like mind that can encourage and challenge you and remind you of the hope that we have, we link arms together. Many of us remember the Chilean miner disaster a few years ago, in which 33 of these men were trapped 70 meters below the surface in, in this collapsed uh, gold and, and copper mine. And so they're down there for 69 days together. I, I can't imagine. And so they've got limited supply of air, limited supply of, of materials. How did they keep it together? How did they keep things from breaking down and, and, and going after each other? How did they survive together in community well, it's interesting, uh, a lot w will point to two of the oldest members, Mario Gomez and Jose, Jose Henriquez. And they were the two oldest miners. And while the younger men are, are busy trying to map out what the mine looks like to send up above, and, and some are, are collecting all their, their supplies and beginning to ration them out, and others are working on supports, the two oldest miners say, if we're going to make it together, We've got to go and make a makeshift chapel. And then they started putting together a rotation of times when the miners would come together and offer up prayers. And they, have, they made themselves available, one for 12 hours, the next one for, for 12 hours, to offer spiritual counsel to the men. When they came up, the foreman was asked, how did you guys survive? And he said, without these two spiritual leaders, we would have lost hope. That's what this is about. We come together and, and experience life in community. It's to remind ourselves of who we are and to remind ourselves of the hope that we base all of our life upon. A third thing is, let us consider how we may spur one another on. Okay, for those of you old school uh, VBS, what, what are we doing here? Roll the gospel chair. How many... How, Y'all want to get your, your gospel going? Come on. You, you remember that? Man, that, that was a blast. And, you know, my favorite part as, as a young boy was rolling over who? If the devil's in the way, well, roll right over him. Boy, we, we just get going on that. And uh, also, kind of a, another verse that I liked was, if a brother is in the way or along the way, presumably out of the gospel chariot, you've got to get him back on. So what do you do? You stop and pick him up. Okay, and, and so that's what we're encouraged to do. So we've got to spur one another on. And that only happens when we start intersecting my story with your story, connecting to God's story. My story with your story, connecting to God's story. We stop and pick each other up when we fall out of the gospel chariot. That's what it's all about. And so when we do that, then we love each other so deeply that we can speak into each other's lives and help each of us continue down the path we're called to do and continue to mature in Christ and hopefully achieve that, spurring one another on to love and service to others and figuring out how to help one another and to live life in community. Well, the fourth admonition is for us, to let us not give up meeting together. Now, for, for some, this is a, a passage you've heard all of your life. And any time you're like, okay, we're out, out of the lake house. Do we have to go into that church? I don't even like that church. Well, let's not give up the habit of meeting together. And so it was kind of a part of a legalistic system where faithfulness to God was equated with church attendance. Certainly, that's not what we're talking about here. But with that said, the spurring one another along and sharing this hope that we profess, it rarely happens if we're not making an effort to be a part of the community? Amen? I mean, it, it's coming not because we have to or because uh, there's a check mark involved, but coming because we want to experience a kind of community that is not offered out in the world around us. It's making this connection. 
And if we choose not to, then we kind of miss out on that community. Ever been to a family reunion and could not wait for it to be over? Okay, ever been to a spouse's family reunion? Good wait for it to be over. Okay, yeah. And, and usually the, the first couple hours of family reunion are great because you hug people and they say, oh, wow, look how much you've grown. And uh, you know, look how much you've grown. You know, and, and so you, you start talking about this and then you look at scrapbooks and sometimes you know, uh, a grandpa will have the old reel-to-reel go and it, that's what I looked like when I was that age. You know, and it's kind of fun. And you're meeting all these aunts and uncles you haven't seen in years and, and you're getting updates on the family. But after a couple hours, you're kind of, <laughs> the weather's nice, isn't it? It's great. You run out of things to say, not because you don't like them or because you don't know them. It's you're not currently doing life together. And so it's hard to have shared experience. Your shared experience is what happened in the past. And so without these day-to-day connections, we don't feel this kind of intimacy that we need for one another. So that's what is important. And it shouldn't be that way within the body of Christ. We come and we're connected because we worship together. And we celebrate life's victories. But we're also there to console each other through life's difficulties. Are we committed to this community? The final thing is let's encourage one another. Now, sometimes when we start writing, you know, we think about encouragement, we think about receiving an encouragement note of, you know, way to go, you did good, or, uh, you know, you'll get them next time, or you're such a dear person. You know, this is so much more what the Hebrew writer is writing here. He's talking about a sense of urgency. He's like, hold fast. The stakes could not be higher. Uh, the second coming is around the block. And we need to feel that. We need to think that that second coming is happening in our generation. That there will not be a funeral for anyone in this audience. That second coming could happen tonight. That's how urgent our community is. And we need to to feel that. Because without that sense of expectation or alarm or a realization that Christ is coming and Satan is on attack trying to go after us, trying to go after our marriages, trying to go after our kids, we won't see the need for this kind of community. We've got to feel that sense of urgency. We have to feel like that it is that important that we pour ourselves into other people to keep our brothers and sisters ready for the bridegroom and invite others to be part of the wedding party. We've got to encourage people when they're ready to give up. The story is told of Ludwig von Beethoven, who was born into a musical family in, there in Germany. And Beethoven was uh, compelled uh, to live a very lonely childhood. Those that knew he had some skills forced him to kind of practice for hours, on day, hours upon hours every day. But out of this, his genius just showed forth At the age of 11, he was composing his own music and conducting an orchestra. In his late teens, he was invited to go to Vienna for further study. And there is where he reached fame and fortune and became introduced to the world stage. But it was also there that he composed and and wrote one of his most well-known compositions. And the story behind that goes like this. Early one evening, Beethoven was walking through the streets of Vienna And he came upon a cobbler's cottage, and he heard someone practicing playing the piano. But what was the tune? It was one of his compositions. So he sat outside the cobbler's, right outside the cottage, and just started listening and heard the familiar melody and some mistakes, different thing. And then he heard the young girl inside just say, I can't do it. I give up. I'm not going to play any longer. And so Beethoven knocked on the door and and introduced himself and walked in. And for the rest of the evening, he ended up playing with her. He offered to play for her, and then he offered to play with her. And as he got to know and was introduced to this inspiring young musician, he found out that the girl was blind. So he dedicated himself to help her to learn this piece. 
And so for hours on end, they played together into the early evening until the candle went out. But it was no problem because you had one person at the piano that composed the music and the other one at the piano who could no longer see the music. So with only the light of the moon illuminating the room, the two played on for hours. And so inspired by this connection with this young girl that later that week, Beethoven composed the masterpiece in which he called Moonlight Sonata. We've got to have our antenna up and see when people are, are struggling to know what's happening, to know them well enough that when they say fine, it's not fine. We're there to encourage, we're there to exhort, we're there to challenge one another. How in the world do we go about making these connections? Well, there's two ways I want to encourage us. One is to have one hand in, one hand in with the community. Five years ago, I lost an aunt to cancer, and because a minister was invited my uncle to come down, even though it was with a different fellowship, to be a part of the funeral service. And so I went down, and, and I flew in and, and, and caught a ride over, and we arrived at my uncle's house. The first thing I noticed is I walked in the kitchen, and it was very sparse. There were a couple of plates full of cookies, but that was the only food. And I was thinking, I know that they've been a part of a church for over 10 years. Shouldn't this room just be filled? And as we spent time the rest of that day and half the day the next day, no one called from the church and no one dropped by to check in on my uncle. It was very troubling to me. And as we went through the funeral service, I, I noticed that there were people that were uh, serving food and, and it had it catered and, and they were kind of introducing themselves to people. And I was thinking, well, being a part of this high church tradition, I asked my uncle, and he said, well, being a part of how this church gets together, it allows you to kind of slip in and to do your worship at, at mass time and then to slip out without really ever making connections. And I, I hope that th that's not been your experience here at Twickenham. I hope you do feel like it's a family. I, I sent out a few emails this week to different folks in the congregation, asking them about their links within the congregation. So I'm going to uh, embarrass them a little bit. I'm going to ask you to stand up, and also if I mention your name as one of their links, stand up as well, and hopefully this serve as kind of a visual representation. Uh, Heather Taylor is in Tuesday morning Bible study with Doris Elkins and Jerry Ledbetter and Pat Helquist and Walena Steele. So all you guys stand up for just a minute and... Uh, other people that are part of that study as well. Brian Flynn and Adrian McGriff both graduated from Tuscaloosa High School in the same year. Who knew? Jim Van and, uh, has helped Colby Cox with his Pinewood Derby cars for a couple of years, and Ada Hanley was given a Daffy Duck hat by Jim Van years ago at Camp Neonti when they were over at West Hunsell. Re Rebecca Tucker helps out Art Leslie with the Art Kids program and also is connected with Sandy Martin, there were problems she had with her arm. And she also gardens with Larry and Norma Perry. Who knew that? Dave and Tracy Stewart are connected to Walton Harless through his brother Winston, who directed the Sunshine Singers, who they sang with at Freed Hardman. Uh, Tatum Coffin grew up to church, going to church with Christy Wells, and Christy Wells went to UNA with Farrah Rawlings. Dan Beasley, who was up here earlier, um, Dan Beasley... Um, competed against and with Clark Anderson 4-H competitions in high school. I bet you've got some stories, and we want to see pictures. Dan and I met for the first time up in Middletown, Connecticut, when I was helping plant a church up there. They came to visit friends back in 1989. Dave Eggley coaches soccer with James Farrell and goes hiking with Ken Boyd up in the sound booth and uh, goes caving with uh, his son, uh, Gregory, and also with my son Colby and I. Delbert Williams helped Tom Brown land his first job in the late 80s, and Tom Brown's instructor on how to use a drafting table was Marvin Krigger years before he met his son, Steve Krigger. So if you can imagine just almost a, a, a web of relationships, these aren't individuals. In our youth group, we had a ball of yarn. And you never do this. And we, you get the ball and you say something nice, and then it goes across. And before long, the whole group has had this. 
creates, creates this web of relationships. This is the vision that I want us to have for the church. Thank you guys, y'all can sit down. I want us to feel like that we are connected. I want us to feel like we're doing life together. And I want you to feel like you're an important part of this organization. And so it has been said that you need five, five strong relationships within any organization to thrive and survive. So I want you to find five people that you feel like you've got a connection with. Five people that you feel like you can go to in a, in a time of need. Someone that you can talk with. And whether that's a shepherd or minister or someone that's teaching your Bible class, find someone to be a part of. Guys, I'm going to talk with you. Girls seem to be able to do this easier. Guys, you've got to find your five relationships that can hold you accountable. If you don't know where to start, join a small group. But I want you to make the initiative. I want you to make that call. But at the same time that we're reaching in, we've also got to be reaching out. The other hand has to go the other way. You know, we always need to have one hand reaching out for those in need of connectivity, both inside and outside the church. And sometimes it's easier with folks that are here on campus. How do we connect with those that you listen to their life and you can tell they're not connected? How do you tell them about what you have? Do you say, I, I want you to come to my church sometime? Well, that's one approach. Why don't you try doing this uh, tomorrow morning when your coworker said, hey, what'd you do over the weekend? Instead of saying, well, we did this and this and went to church, here's what I want you to say. Oh, it was amazing. I connected with some of the most sincere group of people that I've ever met. It was so incredible. When we get together, they challenge me, they encourage me, and they give me hope like no other group that I've been a part of. And I feel unconditional acceptance and community within this group. And you know what? Whenever I lead them, it just inspires me to go love and, and serve other people and, and, and just do things and try to extend this group to others. What did you do? Uh, I just went with my brother down to the Bama game. Yeah, it pales in comparison. We've got to extend and explain what our community of is about in a way that connects with those around us. We need to continue to reach out to our neighborhoods. Lincoln and I were talking about this. And he said, now, you remember back in 2010 when the tornadoes came through and everyone came out of their houses and, and walked around and they're like, hey, let's fire up the grill uh, and we'll have some steaks. Well, I mean, nothing communicates love with, uh, why don't I feed you steaks so it doesn't spoil? Okay, why don't we do it now while the stakes are good and say we want that same kind of love and, and community and we want to connect with you and feel like this truly is a neighborhood. So I want to encourage you to do your best to keep these connections going. Draw near to one another. And I, I encourage us to hold on to hope and spur one another along and to meet with the saints and to encourage one another to truly build authentic community and live life as God intended with one hand out one hand in I encourage us to make connections you know this morning if you're struggling to make connections here on campus please come, come talk with uh, myself and one of our staff guys or uh, our, our shepherds will be available out in this lobby we want you to build those relationships we want you to feel connected and a part of this community we want you to have connections. Let's pray together. Father, as, as we look at this passage, help us to feel the same urgency that the Hebrew writers did. Lord, he, he's combating uh, different theologies and, and different ways of looking things. And, and Lord, as things began to be difficult in people's lives, we have a tendency in our human nature to take a step back if we're not connected with others that help us to hold fast. Lord, help us feel the same sense of urgency that our, our children and our teens and our young adults be an authentic community to help them as they go through these difficult years of 